At the 1989 Winter Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, the hottest new trend in the gaming industry was controllers. Acclaim debuted wireless NES gamepads. Mattel showed off the Power Glove, an early form of virtual reality. Bruderbund went a step further with the U-Force, which let players control a game without touching anything. And then there was LJN's Rollin' Rocker. The Rollin' Rocker allowed players to control games by rocking back and forth on a plastic board. It was awkward to use and wasn't exactly fun. The Rollin' Rocker was more of a novelty than an actual controller, and it quickly faded into obscurity. Let's learn more about this quirky device, how it worked, and why it existed in the first place. But before we begin, I'd like to thank Warby Parker for sponsoring today's video. When I found out that Warby Parker wanted to sponsor an episode, I was thrilled because I've been wearing their glasses for a long time and absolutely love them. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. Sunglasses, progressives, and blue light lenses are also available. Try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. Order five pairs of glasses to try at home for free for five days. There's no obligation to buy. Ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label. This time around, I took the quiz on their website to pick out some new styles. In the end, I stuck with my favorites, the Vons with the Bluebird Fade. But I did get a nice pair of prescription sunglasses as well. Now I'm definitely ready to use the Rollin' Rocker. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash gaminghistorian. That's warbyparker.com slash gaminghistorian. LJN Toys first got involved in the video game industry in 1987. A subsidiary of MCA Universal, LJN specialized in licensed toys like WWF action figures and toy guns like Entertech and Gotcha. But LJN jumped into the video game industry thanks to the meteoric rise in popularity of the Nintendo Entertainment System. In the summer of 1987, LJN became an official Nintendo licensee and published games under the Interactive label. Just like their toys, LJN focused on licensed products. Their first titles were Jaws, The Karate Kid, Major League Baseball, TNC Surf Designs, and Gotcha. The video game business proved to be very lucrative for LJN. In fact, it was helping keep the company afloat. Their Gotcha toy gun line, which shot harmless liquid dye pellets, was a disaster. People complained the guns jammed or the bullets didn't shoot far enough. LJN ceased production, but still had to eat $35 million worth of returns. But thanks to their video games, LJN stayed profitable. Unfortunately, working with Nintendo had limits. As a licensee, LJN had to follow strict rules and regulations. They were only allowed to produce five games a year, which had to remain exclusive on the NES for two years. To keep the profits flowing, LJN turned to making NES accessories. At the 1988 Summer Consumer Electronics Show, LJN unveiled their newest product, the Rollin' Rocker. By rocking back and forth on a stand on board, players could control their games. LJN promised it would transform your normal reflex movements into high-speed on-screen video action, but the public wasn't impressed. Journalist Phil Vettel tested out the Rollin' Rocker at the 1989 Toy Fair in New York and called it something of a cross between a pogo ball and a boogie board. He also noted it was very easy, for me at least, to fall off the Rollin' Rocker. Computer Play Magazine gave the Rollin' Rocker the weirdest award in their coverage of the 1989 Winter Consumer Electronics Show. Besides the awkward balancing act, players still had to use a regular controller for the start, select, and A and B buttons. If you had to hold a controller anyway, what was the point? 
Despite the criticism, LJN pressed forward, and in the spring of 1989, they released The Rollin' Rocker to stores nationwide. It retailed for $39.99, which was about the cost of a new NES game. So how does the Rollin' Rocker work? There's not much to it. 95% of the Rollin' Rocker is plastic, but let's take a look inside. By taking off three screws in the back, we can detach this blue faceplate, which houses the electronics. On the board is a four-way tilt switch. A tilt switch uses a small cylinder with either a metal ball or liquid mercury. When you tilt it, the ball or mercury inside moves and makes contact with the metal electrodes at the end, which sends a signal. So when you lean forward on the Roland Rocker, it's like pressing up on the D-pad. Or when you lean to the right, it's like pressing right on the D-pad. Companies used tilt switches on many early motion control devices, and they aren't the most accurate or responsive. Using the Roland Rocker is pretty straightforward. First, you plug it into the NES controller port. Next, plug a regular controller into the port on the front of the Roland Rocker. The bottom of the device has a half sphere that allows you to pivot in different directions. The easiest way to hop on is to step on one side then put your other foot on to balance out. Now you are ready for some radical gaming. So how well does the Roland Rocker work? Does it allow for high-speed video gaming action? Let's test it out with a few games, starting with a classic, Super Mario Brothers. Using the Roland Rocker really alters the way you play this game. Changing directions or stopping is difficult. Even going down a pipe is quite a task. It's best to lean to the right and play the game like an endless runner. How about a sports game? Let's try LJN's very own Major League Baseball. The first obstacle is picking your lineup, which the game requires you to do. It's exhausting. You know, it's interesting how using the Roland Rocker makes you realize how much you use the D-pad in certain games. Everything utilizes directional movement. Pitching, fielding, batting, and base running. Fielding the ball is by far the hardest. If you are off by even one pixel, your player won't pick up the ball. I gave up a lot of inside the park home runs. Major League Baseball is a terrible game to use with the Rollin' Rocker. Now, here's a game that only uses the D-pad, Marble Madness. I honestly thought this would be a perfect game to show off the Rollin' Rocker. I guess I forgot how much precision is needed to finish levels. The tutorial stage was fine, but I didn't get far after that. The second stage has this very narrow ramp that is almost impossible to get through using the Rollin' Rocker. Let's try a racing game, Excite Bike. The Rollin' Rocker worked okay, since Excite Bike doesn't require too many quick reflexes. On Selection A, you have the whole track to yourself, so there aren't many obstacles. But on Selection B, the difficulty cranks up considerably. I was running into other racers all the time. Since we're using an LJN controller, let's finish our test with a classic LJN game, TNC Surf Designs. This game has two modes, skateboarding and surfing. In skateboarding, the goal is to dodge obstacles and race to the finish. You need to speed up to finish the level, but that means dodging and jumping require quick movement. And as you can imagine, this did not work well with the Rollin' Rocker. Surfing is brutal using a regular controller, so it's next to impossible with the Rollin' Rocker. Most of the time, you will struggle to keep the surfer on screen. Now, somehow, I managed to finish the first round, but I'm chalking that up as a fluke. Fun fact, in their marketing, LJN recommended using two Rollin' Rockers because it gives two-player competition a new kind of thrill. Unfortunately, I don't own two Rollin' Rockers to confirm this claim, but I highly doubt it. The Rollin' Rocker received little to no fanfare. It didn't have a memorable commercial like the U-Force, or a starring role in a Hollywood movie like the Power Glove. By the end of 1989, stores sold the Roland Rocker at a discount. And a year later, you could pick one up for 10 bucks. 
1990, MCA Universal gave up on LJN and sold the company to Acclaim Entertainment for about $22 million. Acclaim sold the toy lines and made LJN exclusively a video game publisher, which allowed Acclaim to get around Nintendo's five game per year licensee rule. To be fair, the Rollin' Rocker does work, it's just not a great way to play video games. Most games require quick reflexes, and a good controller enables fast reactions. The Roland Rocker can't do it. But consider the creator. LJN was a toy company. That's an important context. The Roland Rocker is not a serious controller that will change the way you play video games. It's just a toy, and not a very fun one. That's all for this episode of The Game Historian. Thanks for watching. Funding for Gaming Historian is provided in part by supporters on Patreon. Thank you.